Good morning, church family, and happy Sunday. Today is actually, what is it, Thursday? The after the 4th of July, and my family and I are climbing Mount Rubido. We're gonna pray for you guys, but I know that today is gonna be a great day of worship. Uh, our guest worship leader is back again. She did fantastic last week. Everybody say, hi, Donna. She's right here. Okay, so you're ready? On three, we're gonna say it to her. One, two, three. Hi, Donna. All right, and then we also have a guest preacher today. His name is Tom Fowler. Tom and his wife, Johnny, and a lot of their family have been members at Palms Baptist forever. I mean, I just love these people. Tom has been a pastor in Yucca Valley and in Ojai and several other places, but most important, he's our friend and we love him. He preaches with a pastor's heart and this is gonna blow you away. And so I'm so happy you get to hear Tom today. We're gonna have a great time worshiping. I love you guys and I will see you uh, next Sunday. We're gonna start a series on the 10 commandments. So bring your friends, bring your family. Let's worship God. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Before you, we start singing one other thing. I, 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 I wanna also introduce you to my friend, Caleb. He should be right here. Everybody say, hi, Caleb. You didn't do it, did you? See, see, come on all together. Hi, Caleb. Caleb put together our practices. He's leading our band. He's poured himself into music ministry. So Donna, Caleb, I am so excited. We're worshiping today. Let's go. Let's worship. If you appreciate our worship team, just give him a big old amen. Would you please say amen. Amen. Love you guys, man. Many of you don't realize I have an extensive musical background myself. I am accomplished uh, in several instruments, uh, record player, uh, radio, uh, tape players, that's four track, eight track, and cassette. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the extent of my musical ability, but what a privilege and pleasure to be with you this morning. And, uh, and it, it was such an honor to be invited by our pastor to bring God's word at this day. I love our pastor. I hope you do too. He, uh, uh, he is one of the most authentic honest uh, men you will ever meet. Uh, I had the pleasure of knowing him just prior to him coming here uh, to Palms many years ago and have loved him ever since. I sometimes, I have to confess, I'm envious of David, his energy level. You know, I mean, uh, I see, you know, I thought maybe I'll come in here today and I'll jump around the platform like he did. Yeah, he does, but you know, if I did that, we'd be out of here in five minutes. So anyhow, uh, I'm going to stay within my own, own limitations. I commend you as a church uh, for your thoughtfulness and your care for your pastor and his family. Some churches uh, do not understand the importance of uh, giving them time away, uh, especially, you know, on, on a Sunday, on the weekends. Uh, he loves the church. He is 110% committed in his to the Lord, to the local church, but nonetheless, the, the magnitude of his uh, responsibilities does weigh upon him. And so it's important that we continue to uh, love him, support him, and, and provide for times such as this. Uh, I love music, as I said, but I am not good at it. But a few years ago, our worship team uh, taught me a song. Uh, I'd never heard it before, and it was called Holy Spirit Rain Down. And I like that song, and I particularly like one uh, stanza out of that. And before we go to the Lord in prayer, I would like to, to just read this uh, brief stanza to you, uh, taken from that, that, uh, that song. And as you listen to this, I, I would ask you to perhaps say, I, I want to make that my prayer uh, as we begin to study God's word today. In the song, it says of the Holy Spirit, O comforter and friend, how we need your touch again. That's true, isn't it? Uh, I need the touch of the Spirit, uh, not just every day, but several times throughout the day. Let your power fall, let your voice be heard, and come and change our hearts as we stand on your word. So open up heaven, open it wide, open your church and over our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would indeed be free and present to touch our lives, guide everything we say and do this hour, bring the word of God to life. Father, I would pray that you would bless the message of your word in spite of the shortcomings of the messenger. Speak to us now. We stand upon your word. Amen. 
Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles or however, for whatever form you uh, like to have your Bible in, your phone, your, your laptop, whatever it may be. You know, I was thinking about that this morning. I used to, when I preach, I'd say, if you got your Bible, everybody hold it up, you know. And, and, and everybody held up a Bible. <laughs> and, uh, but times have changed. And I got to thinking about it. You know, I, and this particular Bible I've been preaching from since 1983. And in and, and all those years, I've never had the battery go dead, and it's never crashed. So I hang on to it. I'll hang on to it here. But we're in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. And uh, we're going to be looking, as you can see by the title uh, on the uh, screen, we're looking at the subject of, am I a disciple? I intentionally framed the title in that question and in a personal question because it is my uh, desire and my intent that in our short time together here today that every person present has to confront and answer that question, am I a disciple? This is not a sermon for you to sit there and keep looking at your neighbor and nodding and saying, he needs that or she needs that. Ladies, this is not the one you say, boy, am I glad my husband's here today. Uh, you know, every one of us is going to need this. And we're looking in Luke chapter 14. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, this is the only place in the Gospels that this narrative is recorded. Uh, we know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, oftentimes record uh, same uh, events in slightly different perspectives, but only Luke records the narrative that's before us here this morning. And it's taking place in the last six months of the life of Christ. The public ministry of Christ lasted three years. Uh, began with the baptism by John the Baptist, uh, went through his year of growing popularity, growing recognition, culminated with the last week of his life, the Passion Week of Christ. And we are in the, the, the last six months of his life. So let's pick up the narrative in, in, in verse uh, 25 of Luke chapter 14. We're going to find Jesus is very popular, but I'm going to warn you right now, Jesus never sought popularity. And he never sought the crowds, and the crowds here are going to have a root thing. And just so it says in verse uh, 25, Now large crowds were coming along with him, or going along with him, and he turned and he said to them, Now they're not going to expect what he's about to say to them. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1 said, These crowds numbered sometimes into the thousands. Chapter 12, verse 1 says there were so many people that they were literally walking on each other and trampling upon one another. And so Jesus, in the midst of this crowd, and he wasn't looking for a popularity, though he was popular, but for wrong reasons, he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wow, that's not the kind of thing you say to the crowds. Uh, in, the, in the modern world, we, we want a crowd and we want to keep them on our side. But, but Jesus wasn't looking for a crowd. He's concerned about disciples. Now, very important that you understand when he says here to hate mother and father and leave wife and children. This is not a, a literal teaching. This is a, 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 a technique that Jesus is, is, is using here uh, of intense Intense imagery to, to draw people's uh, understanding. Uh, Exodus, we're told in the Ten Commandments. What are we told? We're told to honor our fathers and our mothers. We're told in, in the New Testament, Thessalonians, that, that a man who fails to provide for his family is worse than an infidel. So Jesus is not teaching us to do something here that contradicts the scripture. But he's using a technique to awaken our understanding. What Jesus is saying here, folks, what I'm going to say to you about discipleship, this is important. You better listen to this. You better listen to this. He goes on in verse 28 and following, and he's talking, he wants us to understand uh, the cost of discipleship. And so in verse 28, he, he talks about a man who's, who's going to build a tower. And he says, what, what one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost? See if he has enough. If he doesn't, he, he's going to fail and he's going to be ridiculed. Beginning in verse 31, he talks about a king. He says, what, what king is going to go into battle who doesn't first step back 
and it's estimate, okay, I, I have 10,000 men. My adversary has 20,000 men. He says, what king doesn't step back, count the cost, and say, wait a minute, maybe it'd be wise for me to go and talk to this guy, and maybe we can settle this. And then he turns back to you and I as believers. And he says in verse 33, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. What Jesus is saying, I am not looking for a crowd. I am looking for a disciple and a disciple that's going to place their relationship with me as a priority in their life. This is what he's talking about. So let's get back to our question. Am I a disciple? Make it very, very personal. Well, let's uh, ask you another question real quick before we go on. What is a disciple? Well, W.E. Vines in his dictionary of Old and New Testament words gives us the biblical definition of a disciple. A disciple is a learner, a pupil, a, a student, if you will, who learns from indicating thought followed by endeavor. I love that. Not only does he just listen, but he hears and then he applies and he acts upon what he has heard. So a disciple is a student who hears the teaching and then lives their life by that teaching. Now it is not exclusively a Christian term. So in the context of our passage, we're gonna redefine the original question. Am I a disciple? Let's take it just a little bit further. Am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? That's the question for this hour. Uh, it's my hope, it's my intent that everyone here, of every age, background, whatever it may be, will consider this question. Well, quickly, let me give you four characteristics of a disciple of Jesus Christ. The first is a disciple personally and publicly identifies with Jesus. That is, he or she will openly admit, talk to others, tell others that I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. The personally, step right, ask yourself right this, simple question right now. Do my neighbors, do my friends, do my coworkers, do my classmates, do my teammates, do they know that I am a follower of Jesus Christ? Do they know that? There's no such thing in the Bible of a secret disciple. Uh, it's open, it's public. And so do your friends know that? Now I'm not talking about walking around carrying your Bible and challenging everybody. And I'm not talking about getting your pocket knife, hey, I got carve another notch on your, on your Bible. You know, I got another one, you know. That's not it. Do they know just by your verbal testimony and the affirming conduct of your living that you stand with Jesus Christ? That's important. That's important. Young man here today, I've met at the gym recently, and I was so thrilled to see him walk in. He's up here visiting with one of his friends in church today. And, you know, I thought, I thought in this message, I, I go to the gym uh, about three times a week. I go in there. A lot of people go in there to get healthy and get buff. I go in there to stay alive, okay? It's, just, it's, that, it's that simple, you know? And so, but I go into that gym, and I'm going to be, and I, I think, I, I'm sure you will affirm me in this, but the language I hear, and, 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 and other things I see and hear in that gym, I, I sometimes think, oh, dear God, what has happened in our world? But I pray they never have heard it from me. Does that make sense? All right, the disciple personally identifies with Christ. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess verbally, openly. Take a stand. Matthew 10, 32, everyone who confesses verbally me before men publicly, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. A disciple will take an open public identification with Jesus Christ. In 1990, when we had the first Persian Gulf War, I saw an interview. Now, if you may remember, some of you will recall, 
but a unique situation developed. We were placing our forces in Arabia, in, in the Arab nation, rather. And there was a very sensitive issue of bringing these forces into an Islamic nation. And there were some conditions bandied about. Uh, you can't bring any Bibles into the country. You can't bring any crosses, things like that. And one of the areas that was very much talked about were female force, armed force members coming in. Would they have to wear the veils? Would they have to follow Islamic tradition and walk two steps behind the other soldiers and things like that? And, and this was, re, was, was really debated. And I saw an interview with a young female uh, service member. Now, I confess, I, can't, I, I don't remember her name. I, I don't remember her rank. I don't know what even remember what branch she was in. But I have never forgotten her words. She said 28 years ago, and I still remember this, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I cannot obey Muslim teaching. Disciple stands openly identified with Christ. A second characteristic, a disciple is obedient to the word of God. Thank you for being here today to hear the teaching of God's word. Thank you to those of you who in the past worship hour were teaching over in the educational building. Thank you to those teachers who right now are teaching our children and our grandchildren over there. Teaching them the word of God that they might become obedient. Remember Vines, a disciple is a learner. Follows the teachings of another. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. The Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples. By the way, in that verse, make disciples is the verb. That's the action point. And then we have three action words. The action word is go and make disciples. As you make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is public identification. We just saw that. And verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. A disciple will be obedient to the word of God. Now, to be obedient to the word of God, what is a prerequisite? You have to know the word of God. So you can be obedient. And again, I thank you for being here today to study God's word. John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my words, now listen, if you continue in my words, then you are truly disciples of mine. Stand firm. Right after the service this morning, the earlier service, a young boy came up to me and he was talking about the message and he was talking about studying God's word. And he said, my dad gave me his Bible study guide that was given to him when he joined the Marine Corps. And dad has been through it several times and now it's mine. And by the way, dad is retiring next year. All these years, he's kept that. Study the word of God, know the word of God and abide by the word of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, one of the greatest uh, teachings in the scripture, uh, five, six, seven chapters of Matthew, it's not about the pathway for forgiveness from sin. It's about living a balanced, healthy life of a disciple. And Jesus closed it in, cha in chapter 7, the story of a rich man and a foolish man. A wise, or rather, it's not a rich, a wise man and a foolish man. We'll talk about the rich man some other time. All right, so, uh, but a, a wise man and a foolish man. And, and, and he said, he said, there was a wise man who heard the word of God and he obeyed the word of God and he built his house on the rock. He said, and then there's another man who heard the word of God, didn't obey the word of God. He built his house on the sand and he is a foolish man. And now to both men, he says, the rains came and the floods rose up and the wind slammed the houses, both houses. And the man wise man's house stood firm because it was on the rock. But the foolish man's house collapsed and it, it says it was a great fall. What was the difference? They had the same knowledge. They both heard the word of God. They had the same circumstances. Rain, flood, and wind. 
One stood, one fell. The only difference was the wise man heard and obeyed the word of God. The foolish man did not. Simple question today, which category do you want to fall into? I want to know the word of God, obey the word of God. I want to be considered in his eyes wise, and I want my life, my home, my family, my life to stand. Well, let's move on quickly. Third characteristic of discipleship. A disciple will bear fruit from his or her Christian life. Now, this is important today. A Christian disciple's life will bear fruit. Not my idea, but listen, John 15, 8, the words of Christ. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and, now listen closely, so prove to be my disciple. It is the natural order and progression of God's design for our lives to be fruitful. Now, spiritual fruit is going to manifest itself in our lives in, in two basic dimensions. First, it's going, to be, it's going to be in our character. Fruitfulness of character. The fruit of the Spirit. Let me read them to you quickly. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And as we grow in the image of Christ, as we're obeying the word of God, we're going to see fruitfulness in our character, the kind of person we are. When I bear fruit, I want to bear a fruit that is, is fruitful and savory and, 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 and is kind. I, I, don't, I, don't, well, I don't want to be a spiritual crab apple, do you? you know? <laughs> I, I don't want people to say, what is wrong with that guy? Yeah, you ever had that? Fruit of character. Then there's the fruit of service. And this confuses a lot of people because, unfortunately, many times we equate spiritual service with the church, a pastor, a teacher, evangelist. But listen, spiritual service is simply what happens is in the conduct of your life, you will have opportunities to serve in many, many ways. Our praise team served this morning. They were fruitful. Dan, when you were up here playing that guitar, oh, you're right-handed. When you were up here playing that guitar, you know, man, yeah, that's, that's spiritual fruitfulness. When the ladies are singing, that's fruitfulness. The young man, I, I so appreciate him, who, who, who came and, and gave the announcements. His life was bearing spiritual fruitfulness. He was yielding himself, giving his time, giving his talents. He was here at the early service. He went home to pick up his family and he came back. That's, that's not sacrificial in the sense of, of you know, losing blood, but it's giving of time and effort. That's what spiritual service is. And God expects us to be fruitful. It should come naturally. Now, now, now follow this for me. This is really important at this point. I want to show you something that these things we're looking at are not independent and isolated. They're all related. It's part of God's design, part of God's order, part of God's process, if you will. So listen closely. First, you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's when you identify with him. That's that moment of salvation. Uh, salvation is the result of a specific decision. I told people earlier today, you don't just go to bed one night lost and wake up in the morning and you're saved. It doesn't happen that way. It's, you're not saved because you were born into a, a Christian family. One old preacher said, being born into a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian any more than being born in a garage makes you an automobile. <laughs> yeah? You, you identify with Christ. It's your choice. It's your decision. And it happens at a specific time. There comes that point that, that, that in your life, through the word of God, through other people, through circumstances, that you come to realize, you know, I need Christ. I, 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 wanna, I, I know I'm a sinner. And, and you make that decision. And that, that's how it begins. And, and having done so, you, you publicly share that experience. And you, and you reinforce it through baptism. Baptism is not really an option, you know, because Christ said, go and, and make disciples and, and baptize them and teach them. 
What's baptism? Baptism is the external expression of the internal experience. So you see, you see the process. So you start, it's that identification with Christ. Then secondly, having identified with Christ, given your life to Christ, you begin a process of, of growing, of maturing. I, I, I laughed this morning, you know, I, I think back when I, uh, well, I, I, I'll be frank, I, I've not always been this old, you know? <laughs> there was a time I was a youngster. And when I was a youngster, I did some silly things. I decided one day uh, uh, I didn't want to go to school anymore. I was in, in first grade, and so I'm going to go home. And it worked pretty cool. I, I just left campus. Nobody said anything. I walked home, walked up to my house, and my dad's car is parked after. He was home for lunch. My plan is going awry. <laughs> and it wasn't too long. A nurse from the school came and said, is, is Tommy here? Oh, yeah. He's in the bedroom back. He's sick. <laughs> Not as sick as I was when dad got home. Okay, but that's another story. Uh, we do things. We have to grow, don't we? We have to mature. Well, same spiritually. We have to mature. And so you take your stand for Christ. You grow in the knowledge of the word. And your life begins to mature. Your, your attitude, your, your spirit is changing. And then third, as your life in that process and during that process, as you, you, you conform to the word of God during that process, then all of a sudden your day-to-day your -day life or what you might call my ordinary life, my everyday life, my routine of my life, it becomes anything but. It becomes something very special because as you are growing in Christ and you speak for him and live for him and treat people with kindness and patience and gentleness and joy and hope and love, you begin to touch other lives. That's fruitfulness. That's fruitfulness. It's not this great mystery. You don't have to go out and serve 20 years in India to be fruitful for the cause of Christ. Do it right where you are. In Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they, that is others, may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, Listen close. I'm going to ask you to change the word of God. Now, I tell you, it takes real boldness to do this, but I'm going to ask you to change the word of God. Now, listen with me and follow me. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. I want you to say, you are the light of your world. Do you get it? Jesus said, we are the light of the world, and individually, you are the light of your world. Young lady sitting right here, you have family and friends and neighbors that, that I've never met, probably never will. They are your world. They are your world. They are your world. Jim, there are people in your life that I'll never know, never get to meet, but that's your world. Bobby in your world. And, and Connor, my grandson, at school. Those are the people in your world. And you can influence them. The disciple is to be fruitful. I saw a photograph of fruitful discipleship last week on Facebook. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, I wasn't looking for it, but there it was. A, a picture, a photograph of fruitfulness. I looked at this picture, and, and, and sitting in a chair was this beautiful beautiful lady. Like myself, she, she had silver or white hair, which by the way, the Bible says you should honor. <laughs> Look it up. Look it up. Okay. She sat there. She had on a beautiful blue robe and, and she had a smile on her face. And I was just thrilled. And there were two guys with her. Um, they were kneeling beside her and they were they were uh, facing the camera, and she had her arms on their shoulders. And they were just grinning from ear to ear. And man, they, I, just, I looked at that picture and I said, wow, that's fruitfulness. Now, let me give you a little background so you'll understand why I say that. That beautiful lady is our sister in Christ, Donna McDowell. She's here this morning. 
And Bobby sitting here took the photograph. And those two guys with, with Donna, on the one side, Pastor David, big old grin on his face. Other side was Pastor Grover, big old smile on his face. There was no Bible. There was no preaching. David was actually kneeling and sitting still, you know. <laughs> That's fruitfulness because Donna is facing serious, serious illness. And, and, and these two men were just there to love her. It's just to encourage her, to support her. And I, I just love, she just, she just had her hand resting on their shoulders. That's fruitfulness. Well, very quickly, one, one last point I must make. A disciple is a believer who publicly, verbally identifies with Christ. A disciple progresses into being obedient and living by the word of God. A disciple will be bearing fruit in their life. And a disciple's life will be characterized by Christ-like love. Listen to this, John. 13, verse 35. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. This is Jesus talking. This is worth listening to. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. By this all men will know if Tom Fowler is my disciple. And it's simply this. By this all men will know if you love, have love for one another. The word there is agape. It's the highest form of love. Selfless, giving love. The love that describes Christ. In the previous verse, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus Christ love you? How did he love me? He went to the cross of Calvary. He died a heinous death, sacrificed his life that we might live. A disciple could have this kind of love for other people. But it doesn't come easy. Let me close with this story. It's a true story in every dimension. You can research it. I, uh, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have had to say it. I would never tell you something that wasn't true, <laughs> to be honest. A man by the name of James Emery Bond. James Bond, I, I, that doesn't sound right, James Bond. So I'll call him James Emery Bond. <laughs> James Emery Bond, in 1964, God opened the door and God did something that was amazing. In 1964, James Emery Bond was 75 years of age. He was living in Baltimore, a local TV station, uh, did a program in where they discussed a, a roundtable discussion of what to do about the rising crime rate in Baltimore. And James Henry Bond watched that, and at the end of that program, they invited people to, to send in their comments. The next morning, he got up, walked three miles to the station. He wanted to deliver his comments in person. And he walked in there, and for, as God opened the door, because it had to be God doing this, they decided to let him have his say, and the station manager said, we're going to even film this. We're going to record what he has to say. And for 90 minutes, James Emery Bond a black man had the opportunity to say whatever was on his heart and mind without interruption. So moving was what happened there that they edited that 90 minutes down and that evening on the TV without interruption again, they aired a program called A Conversation with James Emery Bond. And in his own words, he told his story. He said, as a young man, I was, I was filled with hate. He was born uh, in, in 18, the late 1800s. So he said, he said I, I sat at the feet. He was a grandson of, of ex-slaves. And he said, I sat at the feet of the ex-slaves. I heard of, of the atrocities. And my heart was filled with hate. His own father said, son, you can't trust white men. You can't trust white people. Now, you don't hate them. Fight them every step of the way. He'd go to school, young students would throw stones at him just because he was a young black man. He said, my heart was filled with hatred for the white people. And he said, hate came early and it came easy. In his mid-twenties, 
when he was 25 years of age, now an Army veteran, a truck driver by trade. He saw a neighbor getting a home delivery of milk one morning. They, they used to do that in another time. <laughs> and he uh, thought, I would like to have fresh milk at our home. So he contacted the milkman and said, I'd like to have you deliver the milk. The milkman, a white man, filled with as much hatred as James was, cursed him, hurled a racial slur, and said, I don't deliver milk to people like you. Well, James, that, that, that hatred that was there was just, just roiling now. He contacted the milk company. They, they assured it would be corrected. And soon, in, in the next day or so, the milk delivery started coming every day. But James noticed that after a while, he never got a bill. So he went out to speak to the, to the same delivery man. He said, when, when do I get a bill? And the man cursed him again and, 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 and slandered him again and said, I don't take money from people like you. And then they, James wouldn't let it go. He said, I, I'm going to pay for it. And it came to this uh, insane agreement. James would take the money and place it on the top of a fence post. And then the milkman would go and take the money off the fence post, all to make sure they didn't accidentally touch each other. Hatred, hatred, hatred. Well, God's about to do a miracle. An evangelist came to town. Some of you perhaps are aware of him or, or have heard of him. Uh, he came to town, and his name was Billy Sunday. And he was a former baseball player, a drunkard, a carouser who came to meet Christ, and he became an effective evangelist. And he came to town, and so James decided to go to the services. This is what James said. He said, at the age of 25 years and six months, I went and I heard the gospel. As I heard the gospel, I realized that I needed this. And I walked the sawdust trail. Now, you have to be really old to understand that. In, the, in those old evangelistic crusades, they put sawdust down on the ground. And that was the sawdust trail. We, you, 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 that's a little historical context for you. And he said, I walked the sawdust trail, and you know, God took the hate out of my heart for the white man, and he put love there. Hey, Amen. Is that a miracle? Absolutely. But it gets better. How does it get better? Well, listen, I'll tell you. It, it, the, a few days later, the milkman went to the crusade, and he heard the gospel, and he received Christ. And the next time he came to deliver milk to James, he got out of his truck. He left the milk in the truck. He had a different mission in mind. He went to the door of that home when James came out with tears running down his cheek. That milkman said, oh, I have to apologize. I am so sorry for what I've said, for what I've done. I've accepted Christ. I'm a new man. Identification with Christ. And this is what James said. He said, those two men... Both of them, now that's important, both of them conceive, consumed by the evil of racial hatred, both men, James said, we embraced as brothers. And on that TV program, James said, and by the way, this is James' solution to the crime problem in Baltimore. He said, I have loved him. And he has loved me ever since. Folks, that's the power of the gospel. And that's the power of a disciple's life. And if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to identify with him and for him. You're going to be, seek to be obedient to the word of God. You're going to yield your life to be fruitful. And you're going to seek to love others as he first loved us. Am I a disciple? Only you can answer that question. I've said enough. But now you have to answer it in your heart. Each one individually. Perhaps today you need to come and, and take that public verbal stand for Christ. Maybe you never have. Maybe you need to come and say, I, I want to be baptized. 
Or maybe you are a follower of Christ, but you need to come and say, I've not been obedient to the word of God. And I've been living selfishly, not fruitfully. And I certainly am not living with the love of Christ in my life. You may want to come and pray. You come. Stand if you would, please. We're not going to keep you long. We're not, not going to play on your emotions. We're not going to seek in any way to embarrass you. But if you want to renew or, or affirm your commitment to being a disciple, and more specifically, a disciple of Jesus Christ, you come and do so right now.